Hello everybody, I'd like to welcome you to my YouTube channel. This is Steve coming back with another video. In this video, we're finally going to be getting back to the machine language for the Commodore 64 tutorial, part 3. I know it's been a long time. Um, April was the last upload on this, but a lot of crazy things have been going on, and I'm doing other projects, kind of balancing the scales with Twitch and all that. So I've been pretty busy with a lot of different things. Um, in general, my personal life, some other things going on there too. So, um, let's get uh, started on this, and I hope you guys, and I appreciate your patience and everything. Also, one thing I wanted to mention is I've uploaded several videos on Twitch TV, but I noticed they were taken down, and I couldn't figure out why until I read an article by Twitch, which I don't know how long ago this was, but apparently if you don't, if you have a video that exceeds two hours, they actually start deleting those now. So I may have to keep my videos either smaller or make sure to copy, you know, up, upload, um, download them to my computer before they're deleted forever. I don't know if I can get them back. I worked so hard on a few of them, but they're gone. So we'll kind of move forward here. Also, probably some newer things I might be doing for Twitch. We'll be going more into the, oh, for those who are interested on the other perspective, the Grand Theft Auto series. Um, I'd like to get more into some of those hacking videos because I do have some of those worked on right now. Um, maybe some commoner stuff. I did say about the Atari stuff. We'll kind of see you play it by ear as that goes, but I'm kind of balancing the YouTube channel my newer addition to my website, which is a WordPress website now that's coming out now. I'm redoing the entire website, and I'm trying to move everything just toward the Commodore 64 and get rid of all that other stuff. So let's get started here. Okay, guys, so the last time we left off, we were getting ready to talk about the instruction set for the Commodore 64. Um, I've done a lot of write-up between here and there, but I know I need to do probably a little bit more, but I'm just going to kind of go with what I have. Now, I've been um, using this book um, a lot, for those who want to know. This is the Jim Rutterfield book. Um, you can see it there, Machine Language um, for the Commodore 64 and other Commodore computers. It's got a lot of good reference material. It uh, explains the hardware and, you know, the, the architecture side and just writing, you know, machine language programs and stuff like that. So I'm just going to read this, and then we'll kind of probably start doing some examples. So this uh, video may be more about you just seeing me doing some example series, some coding series. I know a lot of people are interested in that. Um, but we had to get through, like I said, a lot of the actual documentation before we could really get into the really good stuff, the gist of the machine language and semi language and all that. So here we're talking about the instructions, and what Sean's also known as the mnemonics. So next, we will finally be discussing the machine language instructions, as I mentioned. To make this as clear as possible, I have constructed an instruction set that shows the fields required for each command. And let me enlarge this just a little bit here, so it's a little easier for people to see it. Also, we will begin to start writing some code soon, testing the statements, using Vice to execute the code, yet using the CBM PRG Studio debugger tool to review our flags and data received back from the programs. You've already seen me do some of that earlier. Along the way, we will eventually be writing some really cool programs. I put down demos, which are rasters, sprite examples, graphic modes, raster interrupt timers that could eventually evolve into a small demo. However, that is much further down the road. And I'm going to say that is much further down the road because that's a lot of work and a lot of stuff on my plate right now. Um, you also know I was working on a machine language project, but I'm not sure where that's going. So this is kind of like a, a trade-off between that, I guess you could say. Okay, so the programs will start out small so that you can easily digest within your learning curve and they will get larger as our knowledge grows. I'm also trying not to introduce instructions until they have been reviewed. As an example, you won't see an STA, which is a store instruction, until we have covered the LDA, or Load Accumulator Mnemonic first. This will gradually allow you to build upon your own experience as you start adding in new statements as you progress through this tutorial. As we begin to evaluate the instruction set, I want to make an important point. For each section, I included all the known instructions I found according to my research. Also, you may notice that in some sections, I don't review all of them. This is because I am trying to introduce them in some doses and then explain more advanced parts with code later. You have to eat your baby food before you can consume a real adult intake. Also, if you look at the right navigation panel in Word, which is right over here, I have created headers for the main instructions, so you can easily click on that part to visit the instructions, examples, and codes there. As an example, if you just click on this, it'll, if you double click, it'll take you to store here, take you back to LDA. I would do my best to cover the instructions as we start reviewing them. However, some may be covered much later as we discover other instructions that can supplement them. 
And this makes it easier because when you're writing code, you can't sit there and say, here's all the LDAs, here's the STAs, because it doesn't get to really make a lot of sense. You can't really do much with that, explain it, except explain it from a memory perspective. And most books do that. They'll go on to write simple little programs that kind of work from there. And as you start learning, they'll add more advanced concepts. I plan to eventually introduce this Word document as a download on my website for email subscribers. This helps build my list and give you the content you're looking for. So what I'm basically going to be doing is taking this document, this Word document, and I'm going to have it available, I guess, on my new website, you could say. And if you guys want to take a peek and look at my new website, I'll show it to you here real quick. So in case you guys didn't know, this is uh, going to be very similar to the old one. This is my new. It's actually going to have the same domain, which is programmermind.com. So the same URL still exists. But what I've done is I've started using WordPress, which is more friendly for the SEO or the search engine optimization engines. And makes it easier for Google to itemize your content and also not flag it down further or what's called derank it in the search engines. Because if you, unless you really, really know what you're doing from HTML, JavaScript, you know, jQuery, whatever perspective, Google is really going to derank your website because there's a lot of things they need from what's called an SSL, which is a, a secured socket layer perspective so that it's basically friendly to the engines and it's also safe and secure. So that's the reason why I've gone with WordPress.org. So this is it. I'm not going to go into a whole lot, but if you want to check it out, I added a little chat here, but this one isn't working now for some reason. I need to work on some other things, but I've got a lot of this stuff up here, which you'll see it's already existing for the Commodore 64, you know, the same stuff you've seen before, Machine Language Project and whatnot. But I'll be adding more stuff as I go along here. I've got my Twitch stuff added in here and some product reviews and just different things I like to c cover down the road. Now, I do have some Atari stuff mingled in here because I did have that originally on the original, but I'm going to get rid of all that other access stuff. And we'll keep it specifically to 8-bit stuff, you know, computers. Maybe I'll just leave it at 8-bit or something like that. But anyways, that's my website. If you want to go ahead and check out the new website. Now, for those who want to know, the other um, part of the website, uh, this is a subdomain, by by the way. But my actual domain still exists here until I can actually move more content. And I did update a few more pages. But like I said, this one is not SEO friendly. Well, it's just not... It doesn't have a, that SSL certificate on it. So Google has dropped it way down in the search engines, and I've never gotten anywhere with it. You know, I've had it out there since 2009 or something like that, and it, it should be getting a lot more hits, but it's not because of where it sits at a security perspective. So basically, to make Google happy, I've gone with the WordPress, and I'm continuing along that path. Eventually, you're going to see me migrate away from this and move directly to WordPress. That's my goal. Eventually, we'll say goodbye to all this other stuff. And there's so much more, and it's faster and easier to build a website. But anyways, point aside, that's what's going on here. So getting back to the, the, the real gist here, or the real meat, what we're talking about. We're going to talk about the load accumulator first. This is the first instruction. There, now, machine language always um, identifies them as I call them mnemonics. This is the mnemonic, by the way, right here. And it's set in always a three-character letter abbreviation. So the letters actually stand for L for load. D for, is for the LD is for load and A is for accumulator. So it's short for LD accumulator or load the accumulator. You can see it wrote down here, load the accumulator with memory. And this is being taken from my programmer reference guide book, which is around here somewhere, but I don't know where I put it. But anyways, it's got all the instructions in it and it kind of lays them out evenly in the back so you can kind of look at them there. Okay, so I got ambitious and I had to go grab the book, but here it is, the programmer's reference guide. And I said it was actually, I think, is it in the back of the book? I think it's in the back of the book, um, where it talks about, it's not actually in the back of the book. It's actually, I think it's in the center of the book. It's a great book, though, if you want to learn right here, for example. These are like the instructions I'm talking about. And if you go to load here, you'll see load here. So it's kind of in the center of the book. It actually starts at, and this one starts on, what page is that? So yeah, let's skip this one. It starts on page 235 in my book. But you can see the first one, it puts them in alphabetical order. It shows add with care, ABC, and then so on. And as you go through page by page there, you'll see there's more and more of them. And they're laid out just as like these. I graphed them out there for you. So I wanted to show you that's where I'm getting all that from. And um, it's important to understand it because there's various ways you can use instructions in machine language. There's things understanding about the addressing mode, which is what we're doing right now, which is the immediate mode. And then there's zero page down here, 
There's zero page with X, which is the X register. There's absolute, absolute with the X, absolute with the Y, indirect with the X, and indirect with the Y. I know it's a lot to cover, and a lot of them follow the same concept. So it's really important to understand, to know that there's different, various ways you can use one instruction in machine language. It's not like where you just have a, I guess you could equivalent it to like a print command, I guess, in basic, because in print you can do a lot of different things with print. You can actually um, print strings, you can print, you know, regular inside of quotes, you can just print numbers. There's a lot of different ways, I guess, in that same concept. You could use different many things like with that, just like you could with the instruction. Uh, but also it breaks down some specifics that you want to know for the instruction as well. And um, it shows you right here, so we'll be covering the immediate mode first, which um, if you look at this section, you'll see, as also I wrote down here, just as the book shows the status flags here that are used, which is a negative flag, the zero flag, the carry flag, the um, interrupt, the decimal, and the overflow. So you can see here, it's got the address in mode, which is the immediate, and that's the one we're going to be covering, as I said. And then I got, um, I got these uh, titled, I got the address in mode, and I got mnemonics, which is, you'll see an example of uh, the instruction itself, the opcode. That's those numbers that follow after, and you can see where this operand is. That's where this opcode is. I can put it in here, for example, just in case you're curious. That's the operand, which is what this was, says for OPER. Uh, the size and bytes, which is essential when you're writing, especially like in rasters and stuff, and timing. Uh, the number of cycles. Um, Actually, this is for disk size, excuse me. This is what I was talking about for the speed, number of cycles. So we'll be covering that first. But then you got zero page. I won't go into a lot of this because we'll probably be covering that later. But um, there's different things you can do with zero page. When we get to zero page, we'll cover more of those. Um, and then here's the operand again. And the operand, this is the hex value. So this is actually 169 decimal. I guess I could have done something like that. And I think this is 165 if I remember. Um, or something like that. Um, but over here, you can also use your calculator. I got the um, Windows 7 calculator here. I could easily translate just by typing in A9. You can see it's 169. Or if I type in A5, it's 165. Okay, I was right. And in size and bytes, the same number of cycles. And then you've got, like I said, zero page with X. And this is where it gets a little bit more. If you want to basically be able to copy memory, you can take a range of memory and use it with the X register because the X can go from 0 to 255. But like I said, we'll be covering more of that later. The absolute is directly referencing memory as a whole. Or, for example, if you wanted to just look at, like, a peak memory location from basics perspective, let's say you wanted to look at register 53280, which is looking at the border color, you could peek into it and see what value is stored there with the absolute register. And then it shows you the instruction command for that. And you can kind of see it does the same thing here with the Y register. You could just interchange them. Um, indirect X is a little bit more advanced. We'll get into that. It's basically used whenever you want to be able to reference pointers directly inside of a semi-language or machine language. And then you've got the indirect Y, which is more from the zero page perspective. Okay, so we'll basically be covering those much later. Now I also put in some notes here. Um, the asterisk, and this is actually in the book, equals add one when the page boundary is crossed, as according to the book here. And that gets more into some advanced concepts, so we really won't go into a lot of that right now. Um, just things that they want to keep track of, and this is regarding the number of cycles and stuff like that. So here's the definition. As you remember, I always had these definitions broken down so you can try to understand things a little bit better, hopefully. Um, we'll be covering the immediate. So the immediate contains a number between 0 to 255. And remember, the immediate value, if we go back here, is this a value right here after it. It'll say load number 1, for example, would be the 0 to 255, and we'll talk show that down here in a minute. Also known as the byte, you may also hear the term immediate addressing in your journey. Um, LDA, we know that's load the accumulator, use an immediate mode with the value specified, as I mentioned. This will create a value in the accumulator that is used to hold information. It does not alter memory, but it can be used with other instructions to pass data to other instructions and memory locations, and this is known as copying. The shortened word is load A. This means that the accumulator register A is to be loaded with a byte. The operand below is, here's an example, number 1. And this is the hex value for 1. You put a dollar sign and you put the number following after it, the two-digit number sign. You can also just use the one digit, but the two is just, just um, easier to kind of reference it from a hexadecimal perspective. Um, the hash mark, which is the immediate sign, is used to show the address and method that is to be used 
also known as immediate address seem to be discussed much later, which is where we're going right now. So here's an example of it, and I've got this down here behind the screen here, so I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit here. So I move this over, make some room here. You can see the loaded cumulator 1 and you see the A9 we talked about earlier. Um, I was hoping I could get this all on the same screen. I think it's going to erase it. I, yeah, I guess it's not going to erase it like that. So loaded cumulator 1, it, and I put this little comment. Remember, when you use the semicolon, that's a comment, and you can see that's right here. Um, I just put A9 here, but it says put a 1 in the accumulator, or A equals 1. Accumulator is now equal to 1. So basically, remember, it can have the value between 0 to 255. I just used the 1 as an example so we can go with our example program here. The value after the number or immediate or hash sign is called the operand. And I did mention that earlier, but this is just written down in my documentation. And in basic, if you look at this from basic's perspective, think of it like a variable in that way. Using the variable A for accumulator, we would have A equals 1. Or if you wanted to see the instruction, I mean, that's basically what it would look like in basic, except it would have like a, a line number after it, and it would say A equals 1 or something like that. Like that. Okay? Okay, so example I'm showing down here is, um, and this is actually, uh, well, actually, this is from the, the book. I think I could erase this. I don't probably need this one right here. This goes into whenever you're doing the, the absolute. Oh, oh, I see what I did. I broke it down in the absolute. So you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to break off here for a second just to show you over here what I'm talking about. You can see load accumulator the 1 RTS. Now if I run this, nothing real special is going to happen, but I'll run it anyway just to show you. In CBM PRG Studio. Now whenever you run it here, you'll see it's loaded in the, the program here. It loads in the, the PRG file first. And then here it's already loaded it into basically a semi language or machine language if you will. And if you type system 4096, that's where it references. Now, you won't see anything happen because we haven't done anything to this program yet. This is why I wanted to talk about Absolute Next so we can start putting pieces together to write simple little programs. So we'll go into um, the Absolute example. And I think I should have probably stuck this down here. This doesn't make sense to have this right here. I think I'll put this right here. And this one is actually saying absolute X. I think it's the problem is I stuck this in. This is the example from the book that they're talking about the absolute value here. But I'll just read this anyway. So the absolute value, um, remember, the absolute um, is a little bit different than immediate. Immediate is only going to be doing 0 to 255 after that hash sign or that number sign. While the absolute references any memory location inside of your computer. If you remember, the Commodore 64 has 65, 535 memory locations, or 65, 536, we count the zeros of one. And these are 16-bit numbers. The register is loaded with the contents of a particular memory location. And as an example here, this is from the machine language book I showed you earlier, the Jim Butterfield book. It's just saying um, load the absolute value, that's that dollar sign for absolute, 33C, and of course if we needed our calculator, we could go over here and translate it for those who want to know. It's memory location 828, which is just a, a, an empty area memory. Just, you could do stuff with a lot of sprites are loaded into that from a basic perspective. And then here's the comment for that. Load the accumulator with the value found in 828 known as the absolute address. And then, so what I would like to do now before we go into the rest of this is I'm going to, I'm actually, um, I, this is his example. I'm going to actually alter this a little bit because if we use this one, it's not going to get me what I'm looking for. 828, I mean, we could do it. I guess we could show you what it does. It'll store it in the 828 just to kind of be consistent with this, I guess. So we'll change that to store. And I went right into store. And this is why I wanted to cover the LDA because if we go into store, you're going to be like, okay, now you're looking at store. But that's the only way you can write a machine language program. And that's down here a little bit later when we talked about store. So I think what I'll do is I'll write it here, and then I'll read the rest of this, and we'll go down through that. So the operand, the definition of an operand, here's the definition for the operand. The book introduced in Commodore 64 machine code describes that as part of the machine language, the semi language that specifies what is to be done. According to Jim Butterfield's book, Machine Language for the Commodore 64 and Other Commodore Computers, load LDA is used as a copy in action. If we load A, we saw that earlier, LDA from address 2345, we are essentially making a copy of the contents of hex 2345 into A, the accumulator, but 2345 still contains its previous value. Similarly, 
if we store y into 3456, and just correcting myself here, we are storing a copy of the contents of y to that address. y does not change. So it doesn't change anything with the x and y registers until we're doing something a little bit more with it, but it's essentially just a way of referencing the memory location, and that's a little bit more advanced here, but he's just talking about that. The 650X, or the 6502, of course, has, or 6510, he just, 650X, because there's a lot of different processors that work for the Commodore 64, has no way of moving information directly from one memory address to another. Thus, this information must be passed, passed, via A, which is accumulator, the X register, or Y for the Y register. It is loaded from the old address and stored into the new address. And here's my reference material machine language for the Commodore 64 and other Commodore computers. Now, I know we kind of went through that real quickly, so bear with me on that. I wanted to go into the store instructions so we can finally run this program and make it make a little bit more sense to you. So store, a little bit different than load the accumulator. Store is actually storing the contents, so it's actually going to basically be like writing into a memory location. So here's the same thing, STA, or the abbreviation, remember, for the three-letter mnemonic is ST for store, that's short for store, and A for accumulator, so store, accumulator, and memory. And these are the status flags that are used, the negative flag, zero flag, carry flag, interrupt flag, decimal, and the overflow. And then we've got the same, you see I've kept the same um, titling here, the same categories, address and mode, mnemonics, opcode, size and bytes, number of cycles. Very similar, we got zero page, and it shows the, the example for that one, store the operand. And like I said, we'll talk about zero page much more later. It shows the operating code, the size, bytes, number of cycles. And you can see all these are very similar. Um, we have zero page with X. Same thing. We have absolute, which we'll be discussing here very shortly. Absolute with X. We were talking about that briefly a little bit earlier. Absolute Y, indirect X, and indirect Y, which we kind of covered these. These are just from the store. Remember, it's just like copying into that memory location. Um, earlier we were copying into the load decommitter, but now we're going to be copying it directly into memory reference and memory so that we can make changes. And SDA stored the contents of the accumulator in the address specified. This instruction stores the contents of the value previously contained in the accumulator, such as with an LDA, and writes it to the operating memory location. Now this is important because when you copy something into the accumulator, you want to know that that value is still being saved in the accumulator so we can use it to store it into memory. It's like doing a poke 53280,1, which, or in this case, 1024, we'll talk about this very shortly. I use the basic kind of reference it so those who are kind of new can follow what's going on here. So here's an example. Um, I put load the accumulator number three. I'm going to change this to one to be consistent with this one. Uh, put a three in the accumulator, which is A equals, or three, put a one in the accumulator, excuse me. We could just do three, I guess. It doesn't really matter. Let's just do three. Just change this to a three here. I put the decimal right here, but I could also do it like that. Um, put a three in the accumulator, and then we're using 400 here. He is 33C for his example. Um, we'll come back and we'll do this, and then we'll try to do the 400 and show you what we're going to do. Is we're going to write a, a value on the screen to show you like how to print, you know, a, an axi character, a pet axi character, directly on the vice screen so we can see it. So that's what this one is doing. It's putting a 3 in the accumulator, uh, store value of 3 in memory location, as we talked about. Remember, it's storing this 3 somewhere in memory. So I think of it, put a 3 in a box, and it's saving it until you pull it back out. And when we pull it back out, it's going to store it into this register, 0400. Now here's the next slide it talks about. 0400 is a hex value for 1024 decimal, which will place a C, the letter C character, in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. And we'll see this in a minute. RTS basic is 1024 or poke 1024 comma 3. So what I wanted to do first now that hopefully you have a better understanding of how store works. It's basically referencing directly inside of that memory location. And it's going to poke a value into that memory location. So if we had to see this here, um, we're going to erase this one here. 0, 400. It's just, as I showed you over there earlier, it's like going poke 1024 comma 3 like that. And then we're going to run this, and I'll show you what will happen. It will print a value on the screen here. And I'll come back to this 33C so I can show you also how it changes and alters memory location in memory location 828. But first, we'll run this one. Remember, we still have it referenced that our, um, oh, wait. 
what happened? Oh, it, it shrunk it off the screen. I was like, where did it go? Okay, this is because I enlarged everything here as I could figure out where my thing went to. So it's basically the program counter <clears throat> is set to 1000. Or if you highlight over it, you can see it's decimal 4096 because we'll need that to the system. Use the sys command to reference it. And you'll see it appear on that screen. Now look up here in this upper left hand corner right here. And you'll, you should see the letter C appear there. There we go. So our letter C there, now there's no color to it. We haven't changed color memory or anything like that. <clears throat> We're using it directly inside of its regular, what's already preset inside the Commodore 64, the default color, which is this, um, you know, light blue or whatever this color is there. So now, <clears throat> before we go into this, I wanted to show you the 33C I was talking about earlier to show you how this is referenced in memory without seeing something on your screen, but using Jim Butterfield's example for the... Um, what was it the, the 828 3C or whatever it was? What was it? 828 was 3C. Let's quickly look here. So, right here, 33C. I was just making sure I had the right value. So, 33C. So, we'll change this to 33C instead. And again, it's just a way of referencing the non memory location. If I highlight over this too, I think it might even show you that one. You can see it shows right there 1024. I don't know if you can see that, but it shows it for a second there. And it shows the binary value. You see the binary value there, which is the 16 digit number there. And get this to stay on the screen. And it shows the octagonal, which is 2000. It shows the decimal, or octagonal. Oh, come on, stay on the screen here. It shows the decimal. I had to click off the screen to get it back on. It shows the hex value. We can see 0 0.0, and it shows the character value for it. So we'll change this to 33C. And also, I don't know why this is not changing this. 33C, like that. You can also reference it as 0. 33C if you want to see the actual bytes. Should do the same thing. You still see it's 828. Now we'll run this one, too. This time you won't see a C appear when I assist to it. But I'll show you what's going on. And you may understand this from a memory perspective, which we'll look at here. So, um, what was it, 4096? Now you didn't see anything change because we didn't use, uh, we didn't reference screen memory this time, but remember we did change that memory location of 828, which should have a 3 in it now. Now if you want to see if this is actually working, just go here and change this value to something else like a 7, and we'll rerun it. And you'll see that it's copying the accumulator in the 7, and it's storing it in this memory location of 828. So we sys again, you always have to sys each time, and we peek into it for basic, and you'll see that the value of 7 is now stored in the computer's memory. And that's how you can pass values back. That's how you basically start moving that values around so that you can make things start happening on the screen. You can move values in to create like sprites on the screen. And then that's essentially how the computer sees all these, these values and it transfers them to the memory locations. So like I said, this is a pretty simple example. And also oh, the RTS, which I didn't introduce here yet, but I will here in a minute is basically a way of exiting back basic here so that we can see our program otherwise it's going to lock up because if you don't use an RTS it crashes and goes to the stack you know crashes the stack and whatnot so the address 0400 is 16 bits long and so it will take two bytes to hold the address we place the address on the instruction called the operand and memory immediately behind the instruction but there's a twist the last byte comes first so that address hexadecimal 0400 is stored as two bytes which we have 00 first and then 04. The method of storing addresses low byte first is standard in the 6, 650x. It seems unusual but there is, a, there, there, is, there is a good reason. That is the computer gets extra speed from this backwards address as Jim Butterfield states. So here we're going to go right into the RTS because I think hopefully you're getting a, a pretty good understanding of how load works versus store. Now, there's not a whole lot of um, information I have on RTS. So it's a very simple instruction. It's used not only just to exit the basic, it's also used later in what's called subroutines, which is similar to the go sub and basic. So here's the categories for this. We got the address and mode. Um, this one is the assembly language form. I think this might be from a different book because I noticed um, the, the, the titles are different. The app code, the size and bytes, and the number of cycles. And you can see RTS is implied instruction. Um, implied meaning that it, it's basically referencing it immediately. And it doesn't really need other instructions with it. It's just 
implied. It's just one simple instruction, RTS. And then the opcode would be 60, size and bytes, number of cycles, and so forth. So there's really no way to absolutely take an RTS and use it with an absolute value. You can't use it with the accumulator. It is basically as an implied, and it basically references it directly inside the memory. So it's a simple way of the computer to exit out from where it started at. Exit one point to start another point. Okay, so note, I thought it was important to cover the RTS statement earlier since it is used to execute out of the machine language program and into Vice Basic, as I, I mentioned here. So this will be used when we need to look at the status registers in the machine language monitor as a guide. So RTS stands for Return from Subroutine. And, and I'm kind of just basically repeating myself here, but it's used to exit the machine language program. It is also used to return from a subroutine after a JSR jumped a subroutine which will be covering much later. I had to include the RTS earlier for the programs to work properly. And it's kind of all just very simple, easiest way I'm introducing it earlier so that we can actually see a program run and not crash. Okay, so next we'll be going into what's called the index registers, but I think I'm gonna play a little bit more with these values before I try to overload you guys with all this other stuff. Because there's a lot to cover in a semi language. The easiest way to take anything and understand it is to break it down and analyze it into small sections. And that's exactly what a semi language does, machine language. You want to, you got all these different kinds of instructions, or they're called subroutines, and they're broken down and they're made and compacted in one giant large program to make a game, demo, utility, or whatever. So, like I said, I think we'll just probably play with these values some more and probably work on some different registers we could probably do, for example. Um, so this one's real simple, 828. If we wanted to see it like referenced in, we've already looked at it kind of from memory locations. We could basically do the next thing like changing the border color. And we'll just quickly look up the value here, which I kind of have them all memorized, but I just wanted to show you so we can do it here. You can go click on this for decimal, type in 53280, it's D020. And we could change this to D020 to reference the border color. And you only want one dollar sign for absolute. So basically, this is just saying um, 53280 comma 3 like that. And I think it'll change it, CN color or something like that. So we'll go ahead and run it again. And we'll have the system call to activate the PRG. And there's the border color change. Now you see magically. What we've done is we took in one of those values in the accumulator and we transferred it directly into the load statement the immediate value so that we can store it somewhere so the computer knows we're going to be using a value between 0 to 255 or 0 to FFF for hex and then we're going to transfer it or copy it to not it, the load accumulator is a way of copying but now we're going to copy it to memory or copy it to an absolute address where we can actually do something with it and that's what we've done here is we basically copy the border color. So we'll probably do a few more border color changes here. I like this one. It's kind of a green color. Actually, 13, my bad. That's hex value. So that would be, um, what is that, C? I think that's it. Oh, I was off. It's D. So D is 13. So let's run that one. And then we'll run that program. And it's green. So you can see what it's doing, and I'll go back here and show you with the peak command. It's essentially taking those values in the accumulator and it's copying or directing the memory location here. Okay, well, the register 5280 acts a little bit stranger versus the other ones. Uh, I can't really explain that one. Um, some of you will probably explain that in the comments because I'm sure some of you will be able to understand it better than I do. I don't want to go into overanalyzing it, but it, I think it's probably masking it or something like that. But anyways, it's still changing the border color. Um, i try a few different things here to see if I could... Um, anyway. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll next we'll change the screen background color. So we're going to add to this program. So we're going to extend it a little bit. And now what we're going to do is something a little bit different. I don't want to throw you, but you can also do multiple loads in accumulator, and you can immediately write over the previous value. So remember earlier we had this 13 in here. Now we want to change the border color maybe to black. We'll use 00 for the black color. 
to change the border color. And we're going to reference with the memory location D021, which is essentially going to do this. Um, i put this over here, 53381, 0, like that. Move these comments over a little bit there so you can see them. And then we're going to basically, instead of referencing the 13 we had earlier here, you can see the value 13, it's now going to reference the 0 and pass it into memory. Otherwise, it's going to take a 13 and store it into both of them. That's the way you change what's in the accumulator and move it it's so that you can copy it to a different memory address or a different absolute address. So we'll run this and you'll see it's going to run two different, it's running four instructions, but it's going to run two different load accumulator commands this time. I use them in different ways. And you'll see it when I run it. It'll make a little bit more sense. See what it's done? It's left the 13 already in memory since the 13 or this, the decimal value for D, hexadecimal for D, it's now still contained in load accumulator. But now we're also able to use it and re basically reuse the load accumulator and change what was in the accumulator previously. And now we changed it to a zero or black, and we saw that the color background color changed to black. And if we see if we reference it here, 53281, which is what this D021 is here, you'll see it shows 53281. I'm just using the hex value. You can see it's basically it's done the same thing with this weird memory. And I'm trying to use this 255 minus to try to see where it references at from the masking perspective, but I don't know, it doesn't seem to want to work right there. But that's what it's doing. We could also do that same thing with the, the 828. We could use that multiple times here. So just to show you to extend upon this, we'll change and add some newer values in, like 04, and then we'll do the 33C that we saw earlier. And over here, I'll, I'll show what this is. Like that. And then We'll change this value again, so we can use a new one, and then we'll store that. And the next value in line, which would be 829, which is also a safe area to store values in or data or whatever you want to do with it, like that. So you won't see the screen change four different times, but you're going to see that the accumulator is being used one, two, three, four, four different times this time. We'll be using the accumulator here, and we'll run that. And I'll show you what I mean here. We changed the background color again. So all that looks the same, right? But if we peek into these other values, you'll see that those values are now being stored with our new data. Four and five, which is exactly what we have here. So basically it's it first used the, the D to kind of go over it, which is the 13 copied it into the border color, or D020. The next, we reuse the accumulator, so if we're changing that value, and put a zero in it to be copied into the background color, the screen or the, the screen color, which is D021, which you can see here is 53281 for the, the, the color here. And then next, we're reusing the accumulator again for the value of 4, and we're copying into memory location 828. And then you can see that right here. And then next, we're changing the accumulator value again to 5, and we're copying that into 829, which you can see here has a 5 in it. So whatever you copy these values, we'll be able to store in it. And that's how you always know what's going on with your program. Is you always you can use peak, but you can also use the. Um, we could probably go into more of the CB and PRG stuff here if we wanted to. If I wanted to extend this and show you, we could also turn on these other um, things here. One second. Okay, guys, so I had to pause it. Um, feeling like I'm not on key tonight, but what I'm basically looking for is this. This is showing you the memory, and I wanted to show you this so that you guys could see what's going on with the computer's memory here. And this is the same thing you're looking at as you're looking at advice, and this is basically re referencing the, the debugger, which allows you to see the instruction step by step here. And this shows you what I'm talking about earlier the value A9 which is the operating, you can see the value is 0D, um, which is what it's stored in here for the decimal value, for that change in the background border color, and this is the screen color and so forth. Um, I don't know why, okay, it does let me move this one. Okay, I was going to go to uh, 33C here. I guess I have to do it this way, I can't seem to do it that way for some reason. So I wanted to keep this open, let's see if I can expand this, I can't. I can't like, I guess I could just reference it here. 
There we go. I wanted to do this step debugger just to show you. You can see the values uh, changing in these memory locations. So let's um, get this one started. It should go right through them. You should see them. I guess they don't work directly with this one. Unless it hits the RTS maybe. Huh. There it is. You can see them all right now. Okay, so it loaded in the 4 and the 5. So it looks like it does work here. I'll move this over here if you want to see it. I can't, unfortunately, zoom in on this. So you're probably not going to see it real well. But it took what was as you saw here earlier, the 33.4, and I copied it. And this is how the accumulator is looking at it. So this is the accumulator right here. And it's looking at memory from that perspective. It is stored in the 4. And these are one after the other. So it's 33C, 33D, 33E, and so on as you're counting through the memory. And it goes all the way up to um, FFFF. Um, I don't know why it showed FFF8. But basically, um, is a way of seeing what the computer's done with memory here. And if we go to 0, 0400, same thing. You could see, um, or D020, I'll say 0, 0400. I meant to say D020. You could see um, it's got 0 D and it's got the 0, 0 in it. So if we change this one to something else, you would see a different value in here. Let's just say if I changed it to 1, for example, and ran it. It's got like a white color there. So now if we run this one, it should, um, I guess I have to close this to rerun this. Okay, that must be what it is. Okay, so let me just close that and rerun this again. Oh, I'm doing this wrong. I'm going back to my old way of doing it. So I basically need to debug this before we can do any of this. So we've got a project here and debugger and we debug program, excuse me. And then that's what's going to pop it open here. And then now we can run it from the debugger here. And when it's done here, you'll see it spit those values out in here. This one is already in there anyway. So it remembered from last time. So now it's got 0D and it's got 0, 01. So remember the D goes right here and the 1 is right there. So hopefully that makes more sense to you guys. I'm going to go ahead and cut this video off here very shortly. I just wanted you to understand that's what the computer's doing is it's copying values directly from the accumulator and copying them into memory so we can use them. And in this example, we've used several values of the accumulator to show you how you can re use it multiple times to change the values and copy into memory. And this is used much later too, whenever we're copying in large streams of data, like if we wanted to write a message on the screen that's going to have different values in it, we could write them out using something called byte statements to kind of print values to the screen, print axi or pet axi characters to the screen. We could also use that when we're moving a sprite around. It's removing it through memory. We're increasing value. And I won't go too much because it's really advanced. But basically, we're increasing the absolute value of memory and copying different values into it to create you know, animation and stuff like that. So that's all I wanted to do for this example. I'm so glad I finally got back to this because I knew this program, this part wasn't going to be very complicated. But anyways, so, yeah, that's basically what you're doing in, in a nutshell here. We're basically taking values that are in an accumulator from 0 to 255, and we're using those in this example to copy those from the accumulator. We're loading them in a value that's the copying process, so we're copying that number in a memory so we can use it, and then we're, then we're transferring it to another memory location, or we're overwriting another memory location. In this example, we use the store command, or the absolute value of store to store command. Now you can't store immediate value because you can't store something directly into memory that way. It has to store it. It has to be, be load and STA are used back to back that way. You always have to remember as long as your value is copied in memory, you're not going to be able to store immediate value because you're not storing it into immediate. You're storing it into the absolute value, which is what allows you to use like the poke 1024 comma one as an example, or poke 53280 comma seven as an example think of it as copying it into memory location. So as long as you follow those examples, you can kind of work with your own little examples. You can use any of the absolute value of memory locations from 0 to 65, 535. And you want to also refer to your, I don't have it with me here, but the Commodore 64, map in the Commodore 64 to know where all those memory locations are and how to use them and everything. And if you're curious, I have a video on this channel. It's an Excel document I created that shows you how to look up those values and find them a little bit faster. But the book is great too, and there's PDFs you can get online and all that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, short video, um, or 45-minute video, as I keep them to. 
Um, we'll be going to more examples later. I'm going to be involving Twitch and trying to get some more stuff out um, later with that. Um, I also talked about the Atari stuff, but that's going to be just specifically for Atari. When I have an Atari video, I'll announce it here like it's promotional, and then I'll throw it up on the Atari channel to separate it from the Commodore 64 stuff so we're not squishing that all together and confusing people. Um, I originally did that mention before because I wasn't getting monetized for all the channels and I didn't realize I could get monetized for them and I was separating them that way because I was trying to get them all under monetized under one channel but anyways that's just for you know monetary purposes so I hope you guys enjoyed this video uh, please like favorite and subscribe there'll be more videos coming soon uh, like I said my life has got pretty busy I've been working with a friend for the last week helping her find a car and that's taken a lot of my time um, and she's just a new friend I met through Facebook, so we'll kind of go from there. And uh, also, for the people who are interested in the Atari, I did order an S drive for the Atari. I just found out um, just a few days ago it got returned to the sender because unfortunately I had the wrong address. I moved out of my apartment, forgot to realize I didn't update my address with eBay, so they returned the item to the sender. So now I don't know if they're going to resend it or if I'm just going to get my money back because eBay does have uh, buyer's protection to get your money back guaranteed. So I either get my money back or hopefully they'll reship it. You know, I don't know if they're going to charge me extra for the shipping charges, but it's a great device just like that Commodore 64 S drive I have over there in the background. It's for the Atari and allow me to copy Commodore's Atari programs and upload them to um, the emulated environment for the Atari, which is the Altera and stuff like that. So that would be interesting later when we get into Atari stuff. So thanks guys for watching so much. Appreciate you guys. Uh, try to get more videos out, but life gets busy sometimes and hectic and well, you know, kind of like with the Machine Language Project, people get busy and things kind of just go their way or they don't go their way. So I don't know where that's going to go still. As much as I would love to be able to get that thing going, I don't see that foresee that happening very anytime soon. So thank you guys for watching. Um, if you are interested in joining that project, let me know. Maybe I'll just throw um, a handle. I just got too many things I'm juggling at one time. I just a one man show here, so what can I do? But thanks, guys. I appreciate your subscriptions, and you guys rock. Keep on going.